Steve Jobs was the brilliant and visionary entrepreneur and co-founder of Apple Incorporated, who is recognized as the one who pioneered and ushered in the computer revolution that transformed computers into iPads and smartphones and the App Store and music into iPods and TV and mu mu movies into the digital imagery of high definition that we all enjoy today. About a year and a half ago, he died way too early of respiratory arrest that came as a result of his cancer and tumor. In the book Deep and Wide, the author tells the story that when Jobs was 13 years old, Life magazine had on its July the 12th, 1968 cover a picture that greatly disturbed this young and brilliant teenager. The picture was of two precious children from the war-torn region of Bafra, which at that time was a secessionist state in the African country of Nigeria, where more than one million people, including thousands of beautiful children, had already died from a civil war that was going on in that African nation, as well as from starvation and from poverty, and from famine, and from the unclean drinking water and the unsanitary environment in which they lived. At age 13, Steve Jobs found it impossible to reconcile that picture that you see on the screen with the Bible lessons that he was hearing both from the pulpit and in his Bible classes at the church where he attended. And while many 13-year-olds would have just seen that, been sad, and then gone on about their 13-year-old life, not Steve Jobs, his keen intellect would not allow him to do that. And so his biographer describes what happened next, and I want you to listen to it closely. He said, and I quote, Steve took the magazine to Sunday school. And he confronted the church's preacher. He said, if I raise my finger, will God know which one I'm going to raise before I raise it? The preacher answered, yes, Steve, God knows everything. Steve Jobs then pulled out that cover of that magazine right there. And he said, well, does God know about this? And if so, what's he going to do? about those children? Sadly, the answer that he received was less than acceptable to his already racing brain. And after that conversation, according to his biographer, Steve Jobs never went back to church. Isn't that sad? Tragic. Now, I want you to take that story and compare it to the three university students that we had here two weeks ago, who along with 31 other volunteers go to that same slum area in Nairobi, Kenya. But they go to that same slum area that was depicted on that Life magazine scene. And these young people, in the name of Jesus, demonstrate to them the love of God. That slum area that you see is approximately three square miles in size. It serves as a home to over half a billion, a million people, most of whom live in a six by eight foot shanty made of rusted tin and mud. There's no electricity. There's no running water. There are shattered public toilets that those residents can pay to use if they want privacy. So you can only imagine what the vast majority do who can't afford to pay. And like the lake that Danny and Nancy showed near their home in Tanzania, the Nairobi River, which is the main water supply for the people in this area, 
It's full of bacteria, which just continues to add to the problem. But unlike Steve Jobs, who was troubled and walked away, those young people, those university students that we had here a couple of weeks ago chose to do something about it. And so they go to Nairobi and they love on these children and they serve these children through a ministry called Made in the Streets. They work with these children and their families who are destitute, who often sniff glue to ease the pains of hunger. These children often turn to drugs to escape the problems that they have to deal with on a daily basis. And many of them turn to gangs to find their identity and their sense of belonging. This ministry identifies those in those slums who have a heart for a different way out and a vision for a different way of life. And they bring them to the learning center and the housing complex that's built to house 34 boys and 34 girls. And the Church of Christ meets there. And this committed group of Christ followers are demonstrating the love of God in the name of Jesus as they teach these young African children to not only learn a trade, which will bless their lives richly, but these Christians are also teaching these precious children about the true nature of God and about the heart of Jesus and about a life that's lived and can be lived for Him, which is the very best way not only to be saved, the only way to be saved, but it's the best way to find purpose and meaning. Let me ask you this question, what was the difference? between Steve Jobs' response and the response of those college students whom we just met. After all, they both saw the same situation, and yet they made two entirely different responses. So what's the difference? In my estimation, the answer is twofold. It's motivation and your view of God. These young people saw the same scenario, but they didn't lose their faith. Instead, they were motivated to go do something about what they saw. And isn't that what our faith is supposed to motivate us to do? Secondly, unlike a young Steve Jobs and his preacher, they understood the true nature of Jehovah God, of the God whom we serve. He's not some distant God who's up there, who has the power to do something about things but doesn't. They understood that God is at work in this world in numerous ways, one of which is through His people. And they understood what the psalmist said in Psalms 113, 7 and 8 which says this, He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. One translation says, He picks up the poor out of the dirt and He rescues the wretched who have been thrown out with the trash and He sits among them as His honored guest and He gives them a place of honor among the brightest and the best. And one of the ways that our God does that is through those of us who are His children who get it and put our faith into action. These young Christians understood that we're called to put our faith in action like our Lord's brother James said. Instead of saying, well, bless their hearts and being warm and fed, these young people Go love them and minister to them in the name of Jesus. And like King Lemuel of old said, we're all called to speak up for those who have no voice, for the rights of the destitute and the poor and the needy. And in the words of one contemporary song, 
for all of those who are bruised and broken by the fall. One of the many great blessings of short-term mission trips like many of our members have just taken is this. Not only do they get to see and experience situations similar to what we've been talking about, which touches and tugs at their hearts and then motivates them to do something about it, but with a singular purpose, those who go are going for one reason, and that is to love on people and give them the same opportunity that we've been blessed to enjoy, to be able to be a family member of God and be an honored guest who sits with Jesus around His banquet table. That's what's happened the past few weeks in Estonia. And that's what's happened the past few weeks in Antigua. That's what's happened with adults here and see us here. And young people like Jeremy Vaux and many others who were engaging the people whom their lives intersected with, with the good news of Jesus and they demonstrated what the love of God looks like in the life of a child of His, as they befriended those whose lives providentially intersected theirs during the course of a day. I heard that Jeremy not only played soccer with many of his Antiguan peers, but he often took advantage of going through the open door that presented itself. And he, along with many others of our young people, often talk to their peers, their new friends that they've just made about this new life in Christ that is possible for Antiguan children to have, just like our children have. And we praise God that today that Jeremy had the privilege of baptizing two of his new friends, as well as twelve other Antiguans whose names are in the bulletin today, that others of our members were privileged to now call their new brothers and sisters in Christ who will be able to sit at the banquet table with Jesus as well. The challenge for us today is to bring back that same kind of mindset and fervor and put our faith into action around us here every day. The challenge is for you to see your workplace and your school, and your neighborhood, and Cherry Hill, and so many other places in this city as Antigua, or Nairobi, or Estonia. And then let the heart and love of God motivate us to see people in those areas as people like those university kids saw, motivated to go show them the love of God and do something about their situation in the name of Jesus. This year we've been studying about the church's journey and the story of God and what we're called to be and do. But what I'm afraid has happened in many congregations is this. I'm afraid that many congregations of God's people have drifted miles away from God's original intent. And instead of going out from this assembly, being motivated by the cross and what's happened here this morning, and instead of going out from here being in awe of the great God that we serve, I'm afraid that so many Christians simply come here and go through the motions of being at the assembly. And I'm afraid that many congregations simply open their doors three times a week and hope that people will come. And if by chance one or two people do, then sadly the lesson of the Bible class is often on a subject that is not of first importance, like 1 Corinthians 15 says, or it's not on the weightier matters of the law, like Matthew 23 says. That's part of what was happening near the end of the first century in the book of Hebrews. So I want to ask you to open your Bibles together with me to the two bookends that surround the great chapter of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Let's open our Bibles first to the end of chapter 10. 
And after I give you a quick overview of this book, and after we then read and talk about the challenges in this section that's addressed first to Christian individuals and then to the church as a whole, then we'll quickly go to the end of this letter in chapter 13, and we'll look at the challenges that's issued in terms of our relationship and engagement with the world around us. The book of Hebrews was written to a second generation of Jewish Christians who according to chapter 2 had begun to drift. Every person should have their own faith. And some of these Christians were now on the verge of losing their faith because of intense persecution that was being waged against them by Rome. Others were questioning whether or not Jesus, whom they had embraced, was really the Messiah sent from God. And others had lost the awareness that Jesus is ever present with us. Others had compartmentalized their lives and the relevancy of their faith was not incorporated or seen in their daily lives. Others had begun to drift from a close walk with God into an outward and formal performance of religion. But their faith was not transformational because it had not been internalized deep down in their hearts. Doubts were creeping in for many because of what they were experiencing in life. Others had doubts because of a humanistic philosophy of the world that was creeping in to the mindset of some of God's children. And many of them, because of what was happening in the world toward Christians, were feeling like Steve Jobs felt. They were either blaming God for all that was going on, or they felt like the Christian life was just not worth living because it was costing them too much. No one knows for certain who wrote this letter, but one thing is crystal clear. This book is about Jesus. And Jesus is the ultimate answer to every human need. Secondly, this book is also about us. And that's the key phrase in this book, let us. We need each other. I need your love. I need your prayers. I need your support. I need your friendship. I need your faith. I need to see your faith walk, which inspires me to walk closer to the God who created me and the God who loves me. And that's another challenge in this book. So when we come to chapter 10, the writer here is talking about two of our relationships. He talks first about our relationship with Jehovah God and the challenge is straightforward. It's a straightforward command in verse 22 to draw near to God. That's what this writer wants all of his brothers and sisters to do. Draw near to God. And since the phrase, let us draw near to God, occurs seven times in this letter, it seems to be the great passion for this writer. He wants his people not to settle for a Christian life that simply goes through the motions or is distant from the God of the universe because we might view him as someone who's way up in the sky somewhere but not the one in whom we live and move and have our very being. Let us. Verse 22 says, consider not only how we can draw near to God but how we can spur one another on to love and good deeds. Let those of us who are in Christ draw near to God with a sincere heart. Again, the Christian way of life is not a three times a week walk, but it is a continual dwelling and walk in the presence of God 24-7. Not only are we in the presence of God 
right here in His house. But I believe we've got to start changing our mindset to comprehend that we're also in the presence of God when we're at home with our spouse. And we're also in the presence of God when we are with our children. And we're also in the presence of God when we're at work and when we're at school and when we're with our friends. Here's the point. If we don't learn how to draw near to Him in our everyday lives, then in all probability, we won't draw near to Him when we come in here into the assembly on Sunday morning. But when we recognize that we live in His presence all the time, then here's what happens. We will have, the Hebrew writer says, a full assurance of faith. And our assurance will no longer be based, as our Lord's Supper communion devotional said, on our ability to perform or our ability to keep the law perfectly. And it won't even be based upon all the good works that we do. Our assurance will be grounded in the confidence that we have in the grace and the promises of God. Our assurance is full because of the cross and the blood of Christ and because of the indwelling and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. In the language of another great hymn, there's a fountain that's filled with blood that's drawn, been drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners who are plunged beneath that blood lose all their guilty stains. One of the greatest freedoms in the world is the freedom from guilt. And I'll go a step further and say, lose all their guilty stains. One of the great freedoms in the world is to be free from the guilt of, did I do enough? Can I do enough? When we draw, draw near to God, we claim that blessed assurance that we were able to stand by the bodies of those this week who were deceased here, but we believe their spirit lives on. Let us, verse 23, hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. There are a number of ways to do that. But the writer here specifically mentions that one way we can spur each other on to love and good deeds is by not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let's encourage one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. This is the assembly where you should always be confident that you are going to come into the presence of God, bringing God with you, and you are going to always hear about the true nature of God, and you're going to be confident that you're going to hear about Jesus and that you're going to hear something encouraging and you're going to see something encouraging and you'll meet, if you invite a guest to come with you, they will meet somebody who is encouraging. This assembly is designed by God to be encouraging, not discouraging. And so much the more as we see the day approaching. We ought to begin anticipating the next collective assembly tomorrow because it's another blessed opportunity to see the heart of God and be drawn closer to Him and to be encouraged by someone else's faith, which is what chapter 11 is all about. And if the writer here is referring to the day in the not too distant future, when Rome will come in and God's children will be brutally destroyed because of their faith, then they better cherish this time together. And if he's referring to the day of the Lord, when the Lord will return and all wrongs will be made right, 
and our faith will become sight, then that's great too. Because when it's well with our soul, then we have the blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. And this is just a foretaste of glory divine. And in the words of a hymn we sang, just one glimpse of Him in glory will be worth all the toils of life, and they'll be repaid. Along with Acts chapter 2, verses 24 and 25 here are an integral part of the biblical foundation for the ministry of our small groups that we'll launch this fall. Because the vitality of this church is dependent upon your love for God and your love for each other and your love for the world around us. And so an integral part of our life groups will be to keep the love of our members warm and spread that love around, which brings us then quickly to chapter 13. So would you quickly turn there with me, please? After encouraging and challenging his readers by, by sharing the faith stories of men and women old who trusted God and lived out their faith, that's chapter 11. The writer then challenges us in chapter 12 to fix our eyes on Jesus. And then he closes this letter by talking to the church about their relationship and engagement with those in the world. I read this week that there are now 79 million unchurched people in America. Just let it sink in. That means there are friends and neighbors on the streets we live in. And this city is full of unchurched people. What does the writer say to his brethren? Keep on loving each other as brothers, but do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so some people have entertained angels without knowing it. What's the point? We don't stay in this assembly 24-7. In just a moment, we're going to leave this assembly and go back out into the world. And the challenge here is to open our lives and to open our eyes and to open our hearts and to open our homes to strangers. Our life groups will present a beautiful opportunity to do so. But let me say this. This runs counter-cultural to the way that most Christians think and live. Because, please hear me out, I believe most Christians are good, wonderful people, but most Christians will gladly entertain their friends and occasionally will reach out and extend our circle a little bit. But the writer here says Christians don't stop with brotherly love. Our love continues to move toward and show hospitality to who? To strangers. A Christian home is the center of hospitality, where both Christians and non-Christians both should be invited in and to find a warm welcome to a point where they can find a friend who will stick closer than a brother. Obviously, there has to be an invitation on our part, because typically strangers don't come around and knock on our doors and ask to be invited in. Now they come around and knock on our doors. But do you remember the story in Genesis 14, I'll do it quickly, where three strangers walked up to Abraham's tent? Do you remember his response? I don't know if the writer here was referring to that story or not. But Abraham was kind to them. Abraham begged them to come in. Sarah cooked for them. And they dealt with that later as a husband and wife. But she cooked for them. And he showed hospitality to them. And he later found out what? That one of them was the Lord and two of them were angels who had accompanied the Lord. I was in a Bible class once 
where the teacher read this verse and an older Christian who had been a Christian for years and years and years raised his hand and he said, Teacher, have you ever seen an angel? And I thought the teacher's response was brilliant. He said, I don't know, I might have. And didn't know it at the time. You see, Matthew 25 says, when we minister to, to the least of these brothers of mine, we're ministering to whom? To Jesus. So I'll ask you here, practicing, I'll say this, practicing this passage is going to be challenging and difficult. Because most of us just don't do it frequently. And you don't have to answer this publicly. I certainly don't want you to raise your hand. Just think about it for a moment. How many non-Christians have you had in your home in the past six months? Just, just think about it. With our eyes fixed on Jesus, we are called, verse 13 says, to go outside the camp where Jesus is high and lifted up and where unbelievers are surrounding Him and they don't know it. They're in His presence and they don't know it. And the writer said, let's continually offer to God, verse 16 says, a sacrifice of praise, the first fruits of our lips that confess His name. And don't forget to do good and share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. And then the writer closes with these words, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead by our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, May He equip you with everything good for doing His will. And may He work in us what is pleasing to Him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And the church says, Amen. So we fall down this morning, just like we do every morning. And we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, the one who is the greatness of God's mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, He's holy, holy, holy. It's the Lord. That's the message we're called to go embody. And the message that's been shared in Antigua and Estonia, and the message that we are now called to continue to share in our neighborhoods and streets and communities as well. That's the challenge. If you need to draw near to Him this morning with the full assurance of your faith, if you need to follow Colton's example and become a New Testament Christian, buried in the waters of baptism is great, but you may simply be here today being one that needs to renew your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you need to fall down before Him and let Him and God's mercy and grace and the Spirit empower you, to go and live for Him, then we encourage you to come as together we stand and sing.